My name is Jeremy Norman. I'm the principal owner of Soho Gyms. And before that, I was started the world famous Heaven Nightclub. I'm Derek Frost, and professionally, I used to be an interior designer. I met Derek when he was 25 and I was 29. We've been together ever since. I heard on the radio someone saying that spring travels up through Britain at the pace of a walking man. And I thought that was an intensely romantic notion. Every summer, Derek and Jeremy charter Kalani, an 80-foot, twin-screw diesel motor yacht. Usually, they cruise the Mediterranean. This journey will be different. They'll start at the tip of England, the Isles of Scilly. From there, they'll go up the Bristol Channel to South Wales. And from South Wales, up the coast of Wales, across the Irish Sea to Northern Ireland. Then, up the coast of Northern Ireland, right to the very top, to Raithland Island, and then across to the Mull of Kintyre in Scotland. They'll then proceed up the Inner Hebrides to Ullapool, taking in all the famous islands, and then from Ullapool, across the treacherous Minch to the Outer Hebrides, and from there, on to St Kilda, hopefully, if they make it. Last time, after a stop at Puffin Island, they headed across the Irish Sea to the Isle of Man. Beautiful, calm day. And we're approaching my childhood home with the Isle of Man. On arrival, they anchored off Castletown. For Jeremy, it was a chance to relive some childhood memories. This is the Calf of Man, which is the small island off the Isle of Man, uninhabited. What was it like being living on a lighthouse? Grim. And did you witness a dramatic storm or anything? Many. Many? Many. This is a beautiful glen called Glen Willen. It's a truly magical place. It sure is. Today, they set off from the Isle of Man on a course for Northern Ireland. They are heading for Ulster, leaving in the early morning to take advantage of a northerly tidal stream. So where are we now? We are around about here. In this position here, we've got 10, 10 nautical miles to go, which is at 7.2 knots, because we've got the tide against us now quite heavy. That's about an hour, say an hour and a half. Up the North Channel? Yes, until we alter course into, into uh, Belfast Lock. We're right about here, clearing all these overfalls, etc. Right. And we've only got a couple of miles from our alteration of course to get into here and anchor in this bay here off Bangor. So why are we going to Stranford Lock? Because well, that was our original plan. Yeah, right? well, we've got a forecast, which is uh, four six from the east in this bay here. I'll give us a protection from the east southeast winds that we're we're getting at the moment. Well, it's quite something in our trip, isn't it? Yeah. Seen Cornwall, got the Scilly Isles, Wales, Island Man. And now we've got Ireland in our sight. Yeah. So we're marching on. I mean, we've, been, we've done really well with, with the whole weather situation and everything. Yeah. Derek and Jeremy settle in to life on board. Once anchored off Bangor, the crew take advantage of the beautiful weather to attend to some deck work. The warm spring sunshine bathes the town and Chef Wren has already made a trip ashore to buy fresh seafood. Just as we were pulling into Bangor today, yeah. um, I just got off the rib and I spotted a fisherman. Yeah. He literally had about eight, nine big boxes full of crabs. So, so I've gone over there. How um, many did you buy? Um, I believe there's one, two, three, four, five. There's five there, five big crabs. That's enough to feed us all for at least two meals, I yeah. think. And he gave it, and he gave them to us for next to nothing, twenty pounds. What are we going to do with them? Well, I, I've opened. 
one here for you to have a little try at. Okay. I've got some spoons out, but tonight I was thinking I was going to do a, a pasta. Yeah, so you're going to do it what, with some oh, chilli? I was going to do it with some chilli, white wine, uh, pl uh, plum tomatoes, some garlic. Look at him. Fantastic. Go yeah, try some of that. Right. Let's try some of this crab meat. Sensation. So we've been through the narrowest neck. Or? No, over here is the narrowest neck. Right. We're just coming into it pretty much. So that's how are you feeling about busted, coming in there? I'm oh, fine, but I'm just obviously being so alert and, and that's the keeping an eye on everything. That's not green yeah. Because yeah. yeah. so you've got just water. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. And also the visibility is not that great. The no. yeah. speed we're doing it, nine knots. Because of the turn. Yeah, yeah. the flood. What's that? Look there. It looks like a old crane barge. Yeah. The misty conditions and the hazard ahead means that clear instructions are needed. Outway motor vessel, Andrew Sanctu Lock, ahead for the yellow vessel approaching the scene channel zero in. What does he want us to do? Use your radio! Okay. After much confusion, Captain Tim takes urgent evasive action to avoid a collision. He turns the wheel hard to port. They narrowly miss the crane barge anchored in mid-channel. It's only afterwards that they realise how close to disaster they actually came. There were hidden dangers under the water. The barge has eight high-tension wires coming out of it. Right. And you're almost within inches of losing your boat there. I would have thought it just should be buoyed. Very clearly with the starboard hand, or port hand buoyed. It was buoyed. What happened, the boy would just take away at the time? The first boy got cut against the wires within 12 hours. The second boy got just pulled away. A load of What's the barge doing? It's putting in the first yeah. marine turbine in the world. How exciting! Harnessing the, the 10 currents of strength for the lock. And hopefully, by this time next week, it's capable of generating sufficient power for 1,000 homes. He said follow him and he came up that side and I didn't know what he was doing. I thought I was going to follow him this way. Yeah, so that's why it was left so late towards, yeah. towards the yellow boat. Yeah, he shouldn't have told me to go. He, I was reducing my, my sea area from that barge. He yeah, 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 shouldn't yeah. have said on the radio, go Wait to where port, you are. Go to yes, port. Yes, yeah. yes, Turn around and head back out. Yeah, they, they didn't communicate at all. What Turn they around, saying. reciprocal course. Yeah, yeah. And I nearly, nearly ran out of room. Yeah, I know you did too. It was a frightening experience. It was frightening. The tension almost caused him to lose his temper but they are soon able to relax again and appreciate the beauty of their new anchorage. They take a trip ashore with their newly arrived guest, countrywoman Jenny Allen. Well, I'm really concerned because everywhere I look, and it's not just the southwest, which I thought it was, Ivy is taking over, it is just taking over all the trees randomly and it's not just saplings, it seems to be totally random, it will take all the big beautiful oaks, the beach, whatever. So the ivy actually kills the trees? It will eventually, eventually. kill the trees. And you're yes, right, it's it everywhere here. It's everywhere. And, and what do you put that down to? I think it's because we've had such mild winters. You know, the ivy just isn't being controlled as it usually has. I can't think of any other reason. It's certainly very weird, isn't it? Actually, it's a fantastic thing. It's a real Lord of the Rings tree, isn't it? Yeah. We're looking at Castle Ward, which is a beautiful 18th century, early 19th century house, uh, with a classical facade on one side, 
and strangely enough, a Strawberry Hill Gothic facade on the other. The two owners, Lord and Lady Banger, couldn't agree on the style in which to build it, so they split the difference. This is Eddie's side, and Marge's side is the other. You see, Derek, it's, the ivy is going to change the face of the landscape. If you look over there, that one, that one, that one, that one. They will have all gone in a few years' time, five years maximum. Over here, all the big ones. Can you see how they're so unhealthy at the top? Yeah. They're dying. That one, that one, that one. But that's the shocking. whole landscape I mean, that's... is going to change. And it's not just Ireland, it's all over the UK as well, everywhere. Well, here we have a prime example of how ivy is totally killing off this beautiful oak tree. Yeah, and there's no other reason for it to die. The no. top branches are already dead. Yeah. The top branch yeah. completely dead. Yeah. The whole tree has been throttled in its prime. Yes, and it won't be here in a year or so, it's not yeah. at all. I mean, really? that's probably only 70 or 80 years old, that oak yes. tree. And well, they yeah. should live to 300 years. Mm. Well, this piece of rock here is part of a glacial outfall probably and has been scoured by a glacier and rounded and smooth and it's left these very obvious striations in the rock probably caused by pebbles in the glacier so it's like a giant piece of sandpaper has gone over this rock and that was done in the last glaciation as the day comes to a close the heady coconut scent of the gorse hangs in the warm air It's another splendid morning. A friend of Jeremy has given them an introduction to Lord and Lady Dunluce, Randall and Aurora, a young couple with an impressive historic house to maintain. Randall's success in finance has made possible the restoration of his ancestral home. Randall recently started a large-scale salmon farming venture in the bay. Later, over tea, and joined by Randall's uncle, Hector MacDonald, a painter of some accomplishment, they discuss global warming. But not before Randall tells an amusing story about eccentric mutual friends. Now, the story is very simple, simply that Derek had got this Tiffany lamp at huge expense, and uh, he invited Henry and a party around to really to admire it was the object of the exercise. And so for tea. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, what do you think of the lamp? <laughs> well, my dear, it's perfectly hideous. <laughs> it goes so well with the room. So what you've experienced is more rain and yeah. warmer. Since we got married, yes. they were amazing bank holidays. Hey, when, we, when I was courting you. Yeah, the weather was fantastic. <laughs> of course, because we didn't <laughs> as soon as we got married. No picnics. Yeah. <laughs> there's been no picnics since 2004. Right, it's just the weather's been so... <laughs> no, I'm fine. So, so wet. So wet. wet. How are you doing with your salmon nets out in the bay? Well, the thing that happened in November was completely unprecedented. When Ten square miles of jellyfish came up on from the Mediterranean, somehow got onto the Gulf Stream, headed up the west coast of Ireland, and were headed towards the west coast of Scotland. And then there was a very strong northerly gale that blew for a number of days, right. and blew them straight onto the north coast here. Right. And um, we, we lost 250,000 salmon just in the, right. in the space of. Well, it was God. two what hits. Stung by jellyfish. It's they take all the oxygen out of the water. It was ten if miles square. That in the Mediterranean, mm. there would be yeah. huge yeah. plagues of jellyfish. They say so that's to do with global warming. Yes, yes. They say well, that's also around Japan as well. There have been 
or overfishing. Uh, well, Under the yes. fishing as well. Fishing, yeah. Exactly. yeah, but in, yeah. I mean, in these, in, 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 in the Mediterranean it's happening, but is that very rare? That sort of shoaling of jellyfish up here, you've never seen it? It's never been heard yeah. of. Yes, they, and they, they lurked for, I suppose, about a week to ten days in total. Then they dispersed and died. Yeah. Yeah. Having killed off so many of your fish. Yeah. Yeah. The, the runoff from agricultural fertilizers has increased, and the Mediterranean has got too much nitro, too many nitrates in it, mm -hmm. and that this is giving, giving an over bloom of algae, and that's yeah. somehow encouraging the jellyfish. Tons of there's feeding. Any true, truth in that? And, le and not too many turtles. I mean, less so, although that probably brought very few, very few turtles. Sea turtles, 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 turtles to eat the jellyfish. Mm -hmm. Later, at Hector's house... I actually sort of appealed to a charity in, in Belfast and said, could I do something for you? They were an NGO. And um, <laughs> they, they said, well, could you paint an exhibition for us? And I said, okay, I can do that. Um, well, you'd better send me some remotive. Right. I said, yeah. okay, well, it's Rwanda then. So I said, oh, they sent you there? They sent me that. Really? Yeah. And it, it was the right thing to do. I mean, and how long after that terrible event were you there? Well, it was actually it was it was about a year after it. Right. Um, so there were you know the, I spent quite a bit of time in in the camps in what was then Zaire um, as well, um, which was a pretty uh, emotive experience, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, can people survive that kind of an experience and then keep living with hope? Well, that was, for me, what was wonderful is I, the, I met people, Rwandans, who were more basically, say, the buck stops here and, and were sort of doing wonderful things and sometimes very humble people. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was all inspiring, really, to, to see. Is your work influenced by this place which has been in your blood, presumably, all your life? Yes, I, I feel very comfortable here I, and I feel, I feel literally at home here. Right, right. And right. Uh, on that level, it, it, it works perfectly, but in fact, I paint mostly, or a lot of it is, is not here. What I paint, right? And it's really nice. Yes, I love that? It's, it's it's Chinese. That's, this, oh, right. This one, right? What well, this is under construction, is it? It, it? It's yes, and also it's under destruction. You see, the the columns are broken because twice it has been knocked down by winter gales. Yeah. And who's this beautiful young man? And this is me. <laughs> and it, it it had an enormous effect upon me because when I was doing that, I had to stand for 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 weeks for my mother while she was sculpting me. And so I asked a lot of questions, and I had my first sort of artistic experience, naked. My sort of earlier sort of emotive thing, which was, I went for the, the, my session in the maze. The reason to be in there was again, did it, was it, did it have the same raison d'etre behind it, like with the Rwanda, or you were just interested in... In, yeah, in a sense, I wanted to say something effective about, uh, about the, the troubles, if you like. And I actually thought that, that prison was probably the right thing to do, because it didn't put you on one side or the other. They were just prisoners and right. their guards. Right. I, obviously, I couldn't... Um, even draw in front of them or anything like that. They did. They, mm. they, uh, one well, you of took the, photographs. Uh, no, I didn't. No, I just had to memorize because they, uh, I was told mm. I, had, yes. I could not do didn't anything in front of the prisoners. Mm. But there was a. I went to the the gymnasium area, and I saw this scene with the bars, and beyond the bars were the, the showers, mm. and of these tenderly young boys, I mean they were sort of 17, that sort of thing, mm. standing there naked and I, I, that was the painting which I haven't done and which I wish I'd done, you know, mm. because it was such an emotional thing. But the, I, What I just, moved you about that, that sight? Well, well, that total sort of um, vulnerability, ex exposure, vulnerability, exactly. Innocence. Yes. 
and, and innocents, if you like, too. Yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, because a lot of them, obviously, were the you know the fall guys. They were the ones who were given the bombs and were told to throw them by the by the by the big bombs. Yeah. Did you purposely blur the prison officer's face? Well, I, I did. Off? I mean, the, 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 the only thing that matters about him is his authority, if you like, is his right. uniform. And this very carefully painted chain. Yeah. Very yeah. precisely painted, yeah. where yeah. everything else is soft edged yeah. and. Yeah. One of the paintings I'd wanted to do and hadn't done was of the room in which Bobby Sands died. Um, because I, I and I actually spent quite a lot of time doing drawings in the room, because there was something so moving about the fact that this had been all that he had seen and lived with in in, in, in his last weeks. So I went back and and found the room in the Amazing. hospital wing, and I didn't actually do what I'd intended to do the first time, but I, I did that, which I felt was it's a moving what I, picture, what I should do. Yeah. So I'll, I'll choose a few then, shall I? Um, that's the tsunami. Um, that was the that was the last house in a street in Gaul. Yeah. And and the thing which touched me so much is the man was obviously the father of this boy, and he was so proud of him and so proud and happy that I was taking notice of them. You know, there was an extraordinary sort of house proudness about the whole the whole thing, and everything else had gone. It was just a sliver in a, in a, in a yeah. street that had gone. Um, well, we'd love to see all of them. Uh, the Grand Zero painting, I mean, to me, what makes it a Grand Zero painting? Well, it, it's, one of the, it's one of the streets which were looking onto the site, mm. and this is what happened in all of them, is that the dust sort of flowed over these, these right. places. Right. And then what was sort of hideously emotive was people came and wrote messages on the glass. Yeah. This, this mixture of sort of explosion and dust and everything was just the way Belfast used to smell in the, in the, in the, in the bad times. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So it was a very evocative event. Very evocative, yeah. I mean, I think you're extraordinary, quite unique in a way from the artists I've met, that you actually jump on a plane to go to a place where something very serious and moving yeah. has happened with a kind of wish to record it and also maybe to use your art to derive some benefit. Something like those. that, yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, well I think it's very yeah. admirable. And you say your mother did the same. And my mother did exactly the same uh, thing. In yes. Belson after yeah. the war, yes. as a nurse. Yeah. First thing I was taken to when I arrived in Rwanda, sort of completely sort of wet behind the ears, and I was just dropped off at this place. Um, and it, it, it's quite well known, it's called Niamata. Um, and it was summer where there were something like 7,000 people were put it, herded into this church. And then the next day they threw in hand grenades and then macheted anybody who tried to get out and went in and chopped anybody who was left alive. Um, and for me, the most I spent two days just drawing the place and recording it to try and make something out of it. And I suddenly found that there was a line of people, of, of local people, who'd, who'd come up, who, who were watching me. And I thought that was more than I could cope with. I could cope with the dead, but not with the living, so to speak. And then the first of them came up to me and shook my hand. And they all came up, they all shook my hand, and then they went back to their fields. And I was so moved, and I just, you know, I felt that I had an absolute obligation to do whatever I could for them. Had someone placed flowers? Somebody placed flowers, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's very touching, yeah. isn't it? And a sense of in all that darkness and sadness, there's this lovely piece of light. Yeah. Well, Hector, yeah. you've been very, very generous with your time. That's my new child, yeah. How many children have you got? Uh, three got and a half, in a sense. I mean, we're, yeah, we're a stepson. It's lovely, isn't it? Everyone is impressed by the inspiration that Hector draws from tragic world events and how his work helps to record and publicize them. Next time, we have somewhere a whistle. I don't think Jessica needs a whistle to try to Yeah, the bit of backside. Looked at. Oh, really? Yeah, of course we did. On the spot. Really? Yes. Really. This is Paisley. And what was the sitting like with Mr. Paisley? Oh, yes. 
hopeless. Hopeless. That's Paisley, you see, Re a real Mr. Paisley, you see, which in a way is very different. Now I'm just going to do it entirely for myself, but I'm going to enjoy life, normal life, because the trouble with being a full-time painter or full-time writer, I think, is you close yourself off. Brilliant idea, you see. Oh, fantastic. You sit here painting with all the lights you need. Don't you adore it? Yes. <laughs>